This was a man who lived his life in the service of others. He was a confidant of presidents and kings, but he never forgot who he was and where he was from. He worked tirelessly for the people of this state. He will not be forgotten. Senator Hyland's sudden death marks not only the end of 27 years in the Senate, but also of a political era. The question now is who will serve out the remaining three years in his term. Governor O'Neill is not scheduled to announce his appointment until sometime next week, but sources say that at the head of his list are Congressman William Harding, State Representative James Marshall, and Laura Robertson. Laura, listen, everybody. Listen, a toast to Laura. May she go from senior partner in our firm to junior senator. Oh, yeah. 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 When do you think you'll be meeting with the governor, Laura? Actually, I already have. Laura, I don't really think you should. Oh, darling, we're all old friends here. <laughs> if anybody should be the first to know, they should. I met with Ted privately two days ago. I got the appointment. <laughs> uh, folks, folks, out of respect for the late senator, the governor isn't going to announce this until next week. So please, until then, say nothing to anyone. Laura, terrific news. Now, don't you go taking my name off the office letterhead just yet, okay, Elliot? Nothing's going to go wrong, darling. <laughs> she may practice corporate law, but she lives Murphy's. Glenn, phone call. Excuse me. I'm very happy for you, for all of us, Audrey. Laura? Congratulations. Washington is precisely the kind of place where a woman of your class should be. Thank you, Emmett. Hello. Mr. Robinson, you want to see your wife make it to the Senate? Of course. Well, then you and me better meet. Do you know where the Ridge Bar is? Who are you? Just somebody that has some information for sale. Information about what? You know, um... A son, Sunland, Arizona. Why don't you meet me at the Ridge Bar in an hour? Hello. Hello. Glenn? I have some escrow papers to sign, or my new shopping center development may fall through. Oh, couldn't it wait till morning? It won't take long. <clears throat> Mr. Robinson? <laughs> please, please sit down. I saw you on TV today. Oh, you look great. I me, mean, I never go to funerals. Depressing. <laughs> what the hell is this all about? Well, uh... You know, being a senator is a uh, high-pressure, high-visibility job. Now, me, I say, so what? Your wife spent time in a mental hospital. <laughs> Most politicians probably should, right? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. All right. You showed up here because you're thirsty. Sit down. This is what I'm talking about. It pretty well details the nervous breakdown your wife had seven years ago. It's all here. Everything they did to treat her, the drugs, psychotherapy, shock treatments. Now, I have an open mind about this sort of thing. I say if it works, use it. 
But most people, most people are very old fashioned about the mental stability of their representatives. How'd you find out? I wouldn't worry about that. And you won't have to worry about it either. Once you give me $50,000. 50,000? Cash. There's a phone in front of your bank. I'll call you there at exactly 11 o'clock tomorrow and tell you what to do with the money. What if I can't get it? <laughs> then I have to give this to the person that hired me. And by 11 o'clock tomorrow night, Laura Robinson will be the lead news story on every show in the state. And I guarantee you it won't be because she was appointed to the Senate. You have a good day. I nearly called the police. I wasn't sneaking about. I just didn't want to wake you up. Where have you been? Bill and I had to drive out to see the property owners. It got late, so we stopped for dinner. I'm sorry that I worried you, darling. <sighs> you missed a great party. Are you all right? Oh, yeah. A little tired, maybe. Nothing that a little time in bed couldn't cure. Sounds good to me. Glenn, it's good to see you again. Well, hello, Arthur. Uh, I was on my way to your office. We've sure got our fingers crossed around here. What? Laura's appointment to the Senate. Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> I need some cash, Arthur. Certainly. And how much you want? $50,000. Yes, and I need it in a hurry. Well, I'm sorry, but I've got to get the president to approve waiving the notice period for a withdrawal this large. He's not going to be in till 1. All right. I'll be back by 1.30. And I want my money waiting for me. You got the money? Not yet, but I will. I'll get it. You damn well better. Uh, how do I look? Well, I'd say gorgeous. No, no, no. Fantastic. <laughs> how do I look? Uh, nervous. Nervous? Well, I'm not nervous. Relax, darling. You've been to these fundraisers before. But never with a beautiful U.S. senator on my arm. Will the governor be there? At $500 a plate, you'd better believe it. It won't be long before they start paying to see you. I'll get that. You get your coat. Hello. You got the money? Yes, I've got it. You know where the Pioneer Motel is? I'll find it. All right. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to bring me the money to room three at exactly 10.30. Do you understand? 10.30. Right. All right. Ready, darling?
quite a few reporters here who'd like to interview you, Mrs. Robinson. Oh, tell them I'll be glad to talk to them in my office, but not here. Will do. You're on your own. Where are you going? I want to say hello to Walt. I'll be right back. Perry. As always, you look wonderful. So do you. Beard's old. Kane's new. I was skiing yesterday. What are you doing here? I'm at the hotel for the weekend. Trial lawyer seminar. Still practicing law? On occasion. I'm here to lecture. Not me, I hope. Am I intruding? You certainly are. Laura, this is Michael Reston. He's representing the prosecution at the seminar. How do you do? Hello. If you'll excuse us. Can I take you away from all this? Hotel bar, 10 minutes. Very attractive. Very. You know her well? You might say so, yes. Excuse me. It wasn't so easy getting away. <laughs> you remembered. A gimlet with fresh lime. Yes, I remember. <laughs> it's been quite a while. <laughs> Who's counting? How are you, Mary? Fine. And you, Senator? Oh, that's a bit premature. The smart money says you're the one. Who would have thought, when we were younger, that I would become a senator and you'd become, well, Perry Mason? Or that we'd see each other rarely. I've missed you. The governor's looking for you. You remember Perry? Of course. Perry. Hello, Glenn. I'll be right there. Yeah. Until tomorrow. I wish there was more time. So do I. Anybody here?
It's not locked, Della. Perry. I've no right to come to you, but I don't know what else to do. Here, sit down. Can I get you something? What's wrong? Yesterday, somebody called my husband and said that he had a, a file of information that could ruin me. He wanted $50,000. So Glenn took the money to the Pioneer Motel at 10.30. Only when he got there, the blackmailer was dead and the file was gone. What did Glenn do? What anybody would have done. He ran. He came back to the fundraiser and told me everything. What was in the file? Oh, clinical records from seven years ago. My depression. I, I couldn't work. And people were told that I'd gone away on an extended vacation. But you went away to be treated. To the Halvin Clinic in Arizona. I was home within six weeks. And I felt fine ever since. The problem is... The therapy included uh, shock treatment. Proof of that was in the file? Glenn knew what would happen if the media got hold of that file. My political career would be ruined. But now, what should we do? Well, first, Glenn has to go to the police. He has to make a report. But he'd have to tell them everything. Where is Glenn now? At home. Laura, I can only advise you the two of you will have to decide what to do. We're investigating the death of Luke Dixon at... Laura, where have you been? Out getting help. Who's this? Police. Sergeant Austin, Metro Division. What have you told her? Nothing. What is Perry doing here? He thought he could help. Did he? As I was saying, a man was killed tonight in what appears to have been a fight at the Pioneer Motel. The desk clerk says you were there tonight, Mr. Robertson. He said he recognized you from the news. What is it you want, Sergeant? I just want to ask Mr. Robertson a few questions, preferably downtown. My client has nothing to say. All right. Thanks for your cooperation. I didn't know that we'd hired you as my attorney. You needed one just then. We're very lucky to have him. Did you tell him everything? I had to. Perhaps the two of you should discuss this privately. No, that's not necessary. She's right. I'm grateful you're here. I'm going upstairs. Good night, Glenn. Good night. Good night. Perry. Thank you. Is that the Dixon file? I was just taking it to Laura. It's my file, Audrey. I can manage. Thanks, just the same. Here's the headlines on our victim. His name was Luke Dixon. The police said he was a small-time nickel and dime private eye. Said the guy spent most of his time tailing philandering spouses and drinking whatever was cheap. How could he have gotten hold of those files? And more important than that, where the hell are they now? You can be sure they'll surface. Glenn, we should go to the police, tell them the truth. How do we know they'll believe me? The thing is, if you don't come forward now, nobody's ever likely to believe you. Perry's right. Hold on, let's not rush it. We've got to think things through here. If we handle this right, maybe do some damage control. A little stage managing, you just might be able to survive this. It seems to me our main concern should be Glenn's future, not politics. <laughs> that goes without saying. You misunderstood me. We mustn't throw Laura's career to the wolves. Mrs. Robertson, the police are here. 
Show them in. Hello again, Sergeant. We got a tip early this morning telling us Luke Dixon was blackmailing someone, and that if we wanted to find out who, we should check out the Halvern Clinic in Sunland, Arizona. So we did. We were told that some records were recently stolen. Your records, Mrs. Robertson. And the thief's fingerprints matched Luke Dixon's. Are you the person he was blackmailing? That's quite an accusation, Sergeant. Considering you have nothing to support it. Wondering where you lost your cigarette case, Mr. Robertson? You know, the gold one with your initials on the front? How about the Pioneer Motel, room three, not six feet from Luke Dixon's body? You're under arrest, Mr. Robertson. Your Honor, in the interest of time and to assist the prosecution, defendant waives further reading of the indictment and advisement of constitutional rights and wishes to proceed directly to the matter of bail. The record shall so reflect the defendant's waivers. On the issue of bail, does the state wish to be heard? Yes, Your Honor. The defendant is an extremely wealthy man. Not only does he own a home here, he also maintains an apartment in the city of New York and a house just outside Zurich, Switzerland. This indicates not only that he has few real roots here, it also suggests that fleeing the jurisdiction of this court is well within his means. Therefore, to ensure the defendant's appearance in this court, the state urges that bail be denied. Your Honor, Mr. Robertson is a well-rooted, successful member of the community who has never been accused of a crime and who is determined to appear here in court until his innocence has been proven. I urge the court to release Mr. Robertson on his own recognizance. Mr. Mason, I think some bail is appropriate here. Um... Bail is set in the amount of $200,000. Preliminary hearing is set on December 10th. Is that acceptable to the defense? It is, Your Honor. Mr. Reston? Prosecution agrees. Next case, bailiff. State versus Sinclair. I certainly didn't expect to see you here. I thought you would have gone home by now. Well, in view of Mrs. Robertson's political prominence, the district attorney felt that this case warranted a special prosecutor. I'm delighted. Oh? Yes. When Glenn Robertson is found innocent, no one can say it was because of politics, right? Right? Right. Has the governor at all been brought into this? Seven years ago, I became ill, something that currently afflicts close to 10 million Americans. I went away, got some treatment and some rest, and came home cured. It was my husband's devotion to me, his fear that this somehow might be misconstrued or blown out of proportion, that landed him in this unfortunate situation. Given the circumstances, I can well understand why the governor would be reluctant to appoint me to the Senate. Frankly, that's no longer important. My job now is to do everything possible to make sure the truth is told and my husband is exonerated of all charges. That's all I'm concerned with. Nothing else matters. About the Over the oh, 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 What's the matter, counselor? Lose your client. When did you get him? About an hour ago. Hotel said I could find you here. Let's get to work. He's in a great mood. The police discovered Laura's file had been stolen, found Glenn's cigarette case near Dixon's body, and took him in. Any ideas? Only what I've already told you. So Dixon got greedy, tried his hand at a little blackmail instead of turning the file over. Then you think the person that hired Dixon to steal the records is the person that killed him? Sounds good. Paul, here's his office address. See if you can find out who his last employer was. You did say you've been here before. Oh, I used to date somebody who lives up here. Broke up with her about three years ago. Not a happy ending. Let her down kind of hard. Hoping to see her again. 
Della, it's a big city. The odds against that are astronomical. Besides, I checked the phone book. She's now listed. Just bear in mind, both of you, the murder was, one way or another, the result of an attempt to discredit Laura. When we unravel that, we'll get to the killer. Thanks. How is Laura? She's a trooper. Always has been. Uh, by, by the way, Perry, I've been meaning to ask you, we didn't happen to go to the fundraiser because we knew she was going to be there, did we? What are we saying? 35 years isn't so long ago. It was 30 years ago. Who's counting? Not me. Talk to you later. Excuse me, my name's Mason. Name, address, license plate, business phone, and a major credit card, please. I would just like the key to room three. You know the cop? Defense attorney, here's my card. Blitz, blitz, get rid of it. It's Mr. Lane, isn't it? Sorry. Thank you. Quite a game. Right. Clipping? Oh, give me a break. Those referees will do it every time. Well, I want you to tell me and show me exactly what happened last night. You want me to go through it again? You're going to have to trust me sometime, Glenn. Look, I'll level with you. I don't like this arrangement. All right, Glenn. I'll level with you. There's nothing between Laura and me except friendship. Everything else ended a long time ago. I, uh, I walked through the door. It was open. The room was dark. Curtains open or drawn? Drawn. I bumped into the desk coming in. Knocked the phone to the floor. I picked it up, placed it back on the desk. Then I saw him lying there. Then what? I walked towards him. I put on a light. And then moved a carafe or something so that I could feel his pulse. He was dead. And I started looking for the envelope that had the file in it. And I tore through the dresser. And I headed back to the desk and I tripped on something. Right there. Everything fell out of my jacket pocket. And that's how the cigarette case got there. And when you were picking things up, you saw the envelope? Yes. Behind the dresser, the piece of it was sticking out, and I walked towards it, picked it up, looked for it. It was empty. I left. Did you see anyone in the parking lot or around the office? I just the fellow at the desk. Look around and think hard. What else about last night comes to mind? Nothing. I told you this trip would be a waste of time. Waste of time? Not at all. Sorry. Is there something I can do for you? Well, that depends. On what? Who you are. Pete Sutton. 
I'm Luke Dixon's partner. Who are you? Paul Drake. I didn't know he had a partner. I got another surprise for you. Luke, he took a cab. He's dead. Finny. I know. I'm investigating his murder. Uh, cop? I work for a defense attorney. Wants to know who hired Dixon to dig up Laura Robertson's past. Uh, well, don't look at me. I'm trying to see if uh, Luke squirreled away some money. Get my hat before his ex-wife grabs it. Don't spend much time in the office, do you? Why do you say that? You're tan. You spend a serious amount of time in the sun, don't you? Hey, that's very good. Hey, you're a trained observer. That's all right. I do a lot of surveillance. I'm the outside man. You must have an idea who some of his recent clients were. Oh, sorry. You know, you have to ask Luke. That is, if you don't mind waiting a very long time for an answer. <laughs> Didn't keep any records? Uh, well, of course he did. Man was obsessive. Uh, help yourself. In here? No, in the closet. I mean, where else? Here, I'll, uh, I'll even unlock the door for you. It's unlocked. Ah. Uh. Got a report that somebody broke in here. Looks like you're under arrest, friend. Hello, Della. Hello. I think Perry's expecting me. Uh, yes, he is. Sit down, won't you? Can I get you anything? No, thanks. Uh, is Perry here? Oh, he'll be back any minute. Laura. I'm very sorry for what's happened. Thank you. We'll survive somehow. I've always admired you for your strength. Oh, I'm a professional survivor, Della. It's what I do. What about you? How have you been? Fine. Just fine. Steadfast and loyal, as always. That's what I do. Ever marry? No. I've always wanted to ask you, but never had the nerve and the bad manners at the same time. What about you and Perry? I mean... <laughs> All right. Perry and I have... Good. I see you two are getting reacquainted. Right. Laura, it was nice seeing you. If you'll excuse me, I have to go out for a while. Oh, uh, where? Oh, I'm going to buy some supplies. You just bought supplies. Right. Well, I'll just go return a few phone calls. Am I interrupting something? No. No. Bye, Laura. Laura, you said seven years ago when you had your breakdown, people were told you'd gone away on vacation. Who knew what really happened? Let's see, uh, Emmett, of course. Emmett Michaels, you remember him. Still your doctor? Oh, he's still a good friend. Who else? Uh, my law partner, Elliot Moore. He could see for himself that something was terribly wrong. The same went for Jennifer Parker. She not only stuck with me, she's such a determined young woman. Sometimes I think she willed me back to health. And, of course, my assistant, Audrey Pratt. Besides Glenn, that's all. You're certain of that? Yes. 
I'm going to need all the information you can give me on those four people. Why? Because one of them could have hired Dixon to steal your medical records in order to ruin your career. And one of them could have killed Dixon when he tried to blackmail you on his own. Oh, Perry, you're wrong. Those are my friends. It's entirely possible that one of them is not a friend at all. Excuse me, Perry, Paul's on the phone. He sounds strange. Excuse me. Um, I ran out of change or I'd use the machine down the hall. Do you think it's possible I could have a cup of coffee? Sure. What? Please. And who do you work for? Lieutenant McNabb. Lieutenant McNabb. I'm a uh, PI working on the Robertson case. Oh, that's nice. I haven't had an opportunity to meet the officer in charge yet, but they're usually very defensive about a PI on a case. But I have nothing against cops. They do the best they can. You're free to go, Paul. Hello, Sergeant. Mr. Mason. Sergeant. Come on, Don Juan. Oh, do the best you can. The guy searching Dixon's office did the breaking and entering, not me. Any idea who he was? Definitely not his partner, and probably not Pete Sutton either. At least I couldn't find a Pete Sutton in the phone book. I'd like to know what he was doing in that office. I wouldn't believe how much that looked like Linda. Who's Linda? The girl I used to date here. I'm sorry, what were you saying? I said, I'd like to know what he was doing in that office. Oh, my pleasure. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll get on that right now. Oh, Paul. I really don't need any more clients. Just watch yourself. Stopper, aren't you? Okay, so I'm sorry, you know? I saw those cops coming and I freaked. You're not Dixon's partner. You're not a PI. You want to tell me who you are? My name's Wheeler, Sid Wheeler. Big Sid Wheeler. So, Sid, you break into Dixon's office. Now you break into his house. What is this, a chronic condition with you? Breaking and entering? I'm a desperate man, Paul. Dixon had something that I must find. Like what? Pictures. Pictures. That's my wife. I thought she was stepping out on me. So I hired Dixon to follow her. Turns out I was right. And he got pictures in color. Boy, did he get pictures. Didn't he turn them over to you? Hey, gave me a couple of samples. Said he'd keep the rest until I paid my fee. Which he suddenly doubled that little creep. What makes you think they're here? Uh, maybe they're not. They gotta be someplace. They weren't at the office. I don't know. It's just a 
just a process of elimination. He didn't take him with him, that's for sure. <laughs> well, Big Sid, I gotta go. But good luck. Thanks. Oh, by the way, the guy your wife was running around with, friend of yours? Who said it was a guy? chance to say hello at the arraignment. What can I do for you? I need some answers. Anything to help? I understand Laura was under your care at the time of her breakdown seven years ago. Yes. What was your diagnosis? Well, in general, she was acutely depressed. So much so that she simply could no longer function. Now, whether chemical imbalances were a cause of the depression or a result of it, nevertheless, they were there. Once they were brought back into balance via the proper treatment, she was cured. I understand you were instrumental in keeping this episode a secret. <sighs> well, I, I led certain people to believe one or two things that weren't quite true concerning her health, yes. Where were you when Luke Dixon was murdered? You, you surely don't think that I... I had to ask. You don't have to answer. At home, probably reading. Undoubtedly alone. You should have married, Emmett. You'd have had a better alibi. posted. Right. According to my contacts at the Capitol, the mail's been running seven to one in favor of Laura's appointment to the Senate. In spite of what's happened. Or maybe even because of it, who knows. Anyway, the best news is the governor's decided to delay the appointment until this thing's resolved. Proving once again that America loves a devoted wife. And making it imperative that we give them both barrels at this preliminary hearing. Because the way I see it, if we can get this case dismissed without a jury trial, we might actually be better off than we were to begin with. Of course, it's really all up to you, Perry. What kind of progress are you making? You seem quite determined that Laura gets that appointment. I am. It's a chance of a lifetime. For you? Or for her? <laughs> for both. I'm not gonna lie. I joined up with Laura seven years ago because I figured she could help get me where I really wanted to go. And that's to Washington. There's nothing wrong with that. It's natural. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Symbiosis. Only game in town. Who do you think will get the appointment if she doesn't? I don't think. I know. Or at least my sources at the Capitol do. Bill Harding, no doubt about it. Which means he'd have to vacate his congressional seat. Obviously. I understand you keep a residence in that congressional district. 
That's right. But you don't live there. No, I don't. But that's your legal residence. Yes. So if Harding's congressional seat is vacated, you could run for office. It's called hedging your bets. Yes, indeed. You have a phone call. Uh, Sergeant Austin calling on behalf of a Mr. Drake. Mason. Maybe I should open a branch office down here. Oh, it's not going to happen again. Especially if I get my hands on that guy. Still have no idea who he is? Well, he's not a Pete Sutton, and he's not a Sid Wheeler, either. I checked the license number. The plates were stolen. You're dealing with a pro. Yeah, well, so is he. Linda! For a second there, I thought... Good thing that wasn't her. You forgot to hide. You know what? Uh, I've been thinking. It's been three years. She wouldn't carry a grudge that long, would she? You implied she was devastated when you left her. Yeah, but it's been three years. That's practically a lifetime, isn't it? Mr. Mason. Uh, thanks for coming down here to meet me. I appreciate your taking the time to talk to me, Mr. Moore. I'm sure you're very busy. Yes, well, first things first. How can I help you? I understand you've been with the firm for some time. 26 years. Tom Robertson, that's Glenn's father, founded the firm. I was one of the first people he brought aboard. So you worked your way to the top. Tom made me a senior partner 12 years ago, uh, three years before he died. How long has Laura been a senior partner? Just about the same time, 12 years. She also worked her way to the top? <laughs> she married the boss's son. You mean she was given a full partnership the day she walked in the door? Close to it, yes. How do you feel about that, Mr. Moore? I don't harbor any resentment towards Laura, if that's what you're getting at, and I rather suspect it is. The truth is, she's a damn good lawyer. I understand she ran for Congress nine years ago, unsuccessfully. We all worked very hard in that campaign. I also understand you're the sole owner of the LLD Corporation. Yes. Why? That corporation made quite a few campaign contributions in that election. All of them perfectly legal. All of them went to support Laura's opponent. You've been very helpful, Mr. Moore. Thank you. So what you're hearing now is Pete Sutton or Sid Wheeler or whatever he's calling himself these days, trashing the guy's house after I left. You think he was looking for the key? Well, there were six keys in this case when I saw it in Dixon's office. It's only five now. Do I need to talk to Batman? Hey, it's me. What's the morning line on a Bronco game? Well, get your money, all right? How's noon tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be there. Gambler? My theory is he got that tan of his at the racetrack. Huh. A bookie named Batman. <laughs> well, I'll see ya. Where are you going? See if I can track down this Batman. <laughs> well, you certainly have me convinced that whoever killed Dixon had prior knowledge of Laura's breakdown. How many people knew? 
Four to be exact. And each of them with a motive. Della, there were a lot of photographers at the fundraiser. See if you can round up some pictures. I'd like to know exactly who was there and when. All right. Mr. Mason, what do you think your chances are of winning this case? I'll let you know when we win. Mr. Robertson, just how far would you go to protect your wife? I've never even socked a reporter. Mrs. Robertson, what do you think your chances are of winning the Senate seat? As I've said before, my only concern is to prove my husband's innocence. Excuse us. Look, I'd like to help you, but I'm due in court. Just tell me where I can find Batman. Come again? You know, this guy calls himself Batman. He's a bookie. Where can I find him? Try Gotham City. Look, Sergeant Austin, think of me as a lowly P.I groveling in the dirt for tiny bits of information. And then think of yourself in this exalted position at the police department with access to all kinds of information. Couldn't you, out of the goodness of your heart, throw me some small, tiny tidbit? Hmm? You need help. That's the point. All right, try Mitchum's Bar and Grill. Thank you. Sure. You have a very nice smile. Sergeant Austin. Did the medical examiner arrive at a cause of death? Yes, sir, he did. Please tell the court his finding. A deep wound at the temple indicated the decedent fell and hit his head on the corner of the dresser, causing his death. Were there any signs in the room of a prior struggle? It appeared the decedent had been struck on the head with a blunt object. Do you recognize this carafe marked People's Exhibit 3? Yes, I do. It has my tag on it. How does it come to have your tag on it? It was found on the floor approximately 38 inches to the left of the victim. Would that be the victim's left or the onlooker's left? Uh, the victim's left. So, here. That's correct. It has been stipulated by counsel that People's Exhibit 3 was in fact the so-called blunt object used to strike the victim. Were fingerprints found on this carafe? Yes, the defendant's. I show you now People's Exhibit 9 and ask you to identify it. This is the customized cigarette case which was found on the floor of the victim's motel room, directly beneath the front window. Directly beneath the front window would be here? That's right. Were you able to identify the owner of the cigarette case? Yes, sir. It has the initials GR on the front and we traced it to Mitchell's Sterling shop here in town. Your Honor? We offer as Exhibit 10 this sales receipt issued to Glenn Robertson by Mitchell Sterling, reflecting the sale of one cigarette case engraved with the initials G.R. on the front. Mr. Mason? No objection. Thank you. Sergeant Austin, in the course of your investigation, did you discover anything else, anything else, that could link the defendant, Glenn Robertson, to the victim, Luke Dixon? Yes, sir. The morning after the murder, we received an anonymous phone call telling us Luke Dixon was a blackmailer. Acting on the caller's information, we contacted the Halvern Clinic in Sunlin, Arizona, and learned that records detailing the hospitalization and treatment of Laura Robertson had recently been stolen. Did you discover who stole those records? Fingerprints found at the scene of the burglary at the Halvern Clinic match those of the deceased Luke Dixon. Thank you, Sergeant Austin. No further questions? Your witness? Sergeant Austin, other than on the carafe, where else in that motel room were Glenn Robertson's fingerprints found? They were all over the room. On the chest of drawers? Yes. Desk? Yes. The phone? Yes. Were anyone else's fingerprints found on the phone? No, just his. Doesn't that strike you as rather unusual? No. No? A motel room phone gets a good deal of use. Yet on that particular phone, only one set of fingerprints were found. Now, what does that suggest to you? That somebody cleaned it. 
A maid? Or someone else? Someone who was in that room ahead of Glenn Robertson, someone who wiped the phone clean to make sure no one would know who the killer was. Objection, Your Honor. Calls for speculation on the part of the witness. Sustained. Let's go back to the murder weapon, Sergeant. How many sets of prints were on the carafe? Just one. Dixon's? No, Glenn Robertson's. Then it, too, had been wiped clean? Objection, speculation. Sorry, Your Honor. No further questions. You may step down. Mr. Reston, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The people call Mr. Robert Lane to the stand. Were you working at the Pioneer Motel the evening that Luke Dixon was killed, Mr. Lane? I sure was. On that evening at around 10.30, did you see anyone arrive at the motel? Yes. That person right there. Let the record show that the witness has identified the defendant, Glenn Robertson, as the person he saw that night at the motel. Did you happen to notice where he went, Mr. Lane? To room three. Room three. You're certain? From the front desk, I have a clear view of everything. And I've got a hell of a memory. That being the case, uh, Mr. Lane, did you see anyone else go into room three that evening? No, sir. And I was right there at the front desk from 8 o'clock on. No one else went near that room. Thank you. Your witness. Mr. Lane, on the night of the murder, your shift at the motel began at 8 in the evening and ended at 8 in the morning, did it not? Yes, it did. 12 hours. How do you usually pass the time? Watch TV. Sometimes read. Is it possible someone could slip by you unseen while you're engrossed in one of these activities? I can see things out of the corner of my eye that most people can't see looking straight on. My boss will tell you. He did. He also said you're quite a football fan. Oh, you better believe it. I never miss a Bronco game. I understand the game they played recently against the 49ers was pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. Especially the last quarter. Oh? Why was that? Your Honor, I object. What possible relevance can a discussion of a football game have to this case? I intend to show relevance, Your Honor. I beg the court to bear with me just a moment or two longer. Very well. Proceed. What happened in the last quarter of that game, Mr. Lane? I'm sure you remember. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, score's tied with two minutes to go. 49ers have the ball on their own 48. Montana drops back, it's a draw play, bam, stop the line of scrimmage, no gain. Second down, Montana takes a snap, drops back again, Broncos rush, crowd's going berserk. Uh, Montana hits a screen pass, bam, out of bounds on our 44. It's third and short, they rush, we hold, out comes the field goal unit from the 50, bam, from the 50-yard line, he hits it, 49ers are up by three. Your Honor. Quickly, Mr. Lane, tell us about the last minute. Okay. There's 32 seconds to go. 49ers have the ball again on R46. It's second and seven, and they're killing the clock. Fans are heading for the exits. TV announcers thanking all his engineers. Montana runs a simple off-tackle rush. Bam, there's a fumble. It's a huge pileup. One by one, the referee pulls off the players. There's a Bronco at the bottom. Bam, Bronco's ball, and Mr. John Elway leads his team out onto the field. It's first and 10, 27 seconds to go. Bam, Elway hits it down and out on their 48. Stops the clock with 22 seconds to go. Second and four, Elway takes the snap. Drops back, two 49ers bust through, Elway scrambles. Bam, he hits a fly pattern on the 20. There's one 49er between our guy and the game. Their guy dies, our guy cuts. Bam, TD, Broncos win, it was awesome. I remind the spectators this is a courtroom, not a nightclub. Any further disturbances and I will have this courtroom cleared. Yes, Mr. Lane, it certainly was awesome. You uh, watched the game on TV? Uh, most of it, yes. At work? Uh, yes, I think I was at work. Do you recall what night that was, Mr. Lane? I can't write off, no. It was the night of September 12th, the night of the murder. Isn't it true, Mr. Lane, that from the moment you arrived at work, you were watching the game? Well, yes. Isn't it true the game ended at 
And it was at that time you saw Glenn Robertson arrive at the motel? Yes. Isn't it also true any number of people could have gotten into that room without your seeing them while you were watching the game? Yes, I suppose so, but... Thank you, Mr. Lane. No further questions. You may step down. Call your next witness. Your Honor, the prosecution rests. Court will recess until 2.30 this afternoon. Pete Dixon. Uh, meet me at the Crestmore Savings Alone at 4 o'clock this afternoon. We'll wrap things up. No, but I will. Right. Does that call have anything to do with the Robertson case? I think we should talk, Mr. Dixon. You by any chance Luke Dixon's brother? Oh, it wasn't by chance. My parents, they worked hard to have me. Now, this is beside. I may never forgive you. I swear. Drake. Should I be flattered? If you like being compared to a bad cold, unpleasant, hard to get rid of. No, no. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. What's in there? Ooh. New money. Uh-huh. Real name is Pete Dixon, as in Luke Dixon. You ever heard of him? If you want a rap sheet on him, check with records. I wonder what this is doing in here. Not on here. The safe deposit key is from Crestmore Savings and Loan. Well, Dixon's supposed to meet someone there at 4 o'clock. Do you mind if I... Uh, sorry. I think you're done here. I think you're right. Thank you. Sure. I won't forget this. Here are the photos I've come up with so far from the fundraiser. Let me see them. There isn't time. Perry, what do you want them for? Well, I don't know yet. I checked down Pete Dixon. He's done time for forgery, fraud, and grand theft auto. He must have had some angle on this case, knew who Luke Dixon was working for. Thought perhaps he could get some money out of it. How is he? He's still unconscious. We could keep that appointment for him, unless he comes to tell us who he was going to meet. Thank you. Bad news? That's a good question. All rise. Court is reconvened. Be seated. Mr. Mason, you may call your first witness. I call Dr. Emmett Michaels to the stand. Dr. Michaels, you were Laura Robertson's doctor at the time of her breakdown seven years ago. Is that correct? Yes. Now, exactly, exactly what was her condition? 
Well, she was suffering from a psychosis known as manic depression. In layman's terms, uh, she was on an emotional roller coaster over which she had no control. Fortunately, as most cases nowadays, she responded well and quickly to the treatment. Your treatment? <laughs> yes, my treatment. And what did your treatment consist of, Dr. Michaels? Well, mostly just regular doses of an antidepressant, uh, trimipramine, I believe. And shock treatment? Yes, it was uh, some electroconvulsive therapy, yes. That therapy is very controversial, is it not? And wasn't it controversial seven years ago as well? It was effective seven years ago, and the diagnosis I had made in Laura's case warranted it. I don't suppose you could give us the name of a medical authority who concurs with your diagnosis. Yes, I could. Dr. Arlington agrees with me. Who is Dr. Arlington? He's a psychiatrist, Mr. Mason. Probably one of the most famous England ever produced. We're not above a little edification, Doctor. Tell us more. Ten years ago, he published of a book called Arlington on Manic Depressives. Is Arlington on Manic Depressives considered definitive? Yes, it's the definitive book on the subject. And in that book, he agrees with your diagnosis? Completely. Thank you. Could you show us where Dr. Arlington agrees with you? That is a copy of Arlington on manic depressives, identical to the one I saw in your office. Please show the court where in that book Dr. Arlington agrees with you. Now. Yes, now. Show us, please. Well, I can't. I can't do that now, as you can see. That's a very thick book. I don't want to take up the court's time at searching through them. Don't you even know where approximately in the book he agrees with you? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I would have to go through the whole book. I don't think that we have time for that now. Dr. Michaels, in order to hear the truth, I'm sure this court will give you all the time in the world. Your Honor, I object. Dr. Michaels is not on trial here. Your Honor, the prosecution is basing its whole case against my client on the idea that the murder of which he stands accused was the result of a blackmailing scheme. None of this is relevant. The scheme only a handful of people, the people who knew about Laura Robertson's medical history, could have orchestrated. I submit that the prosecution has left me no choice but to pursue this line of questioning. Objection overruled. The court is still waiting for you to show us where in that book Dr. Arlington agrees with you. have been in love with Laura Robertson? I suppose so. Yes. Isn't it true you were despondent when she married Glenn Robertson? Yes. Isn't it true that you diagnosed her condition as emotional instability to keep her dependent on you? No. Isn't it true that you subjected her to unnecessary shock treatment because you were afraid you were losing your influence over her? No. Isn't it true you knew if this treatment ever became public, it would ruin her career? I prescribed it. 
because it was uh, consistent with my diagnosis. A diagnosis based on your need to manipulate and control the woman you couldn't have. Oh, Dr. Michaels. How could you say you love her? You don't even know the meaning of the word. No further questions. You may step down. This court will adjourn until 9 a.m. tomorrow. All right. shows up to keep that meeting Pete Dixon arranged as the blackmail. Linda. Paul? Linda. Paul! Linda! Paul! How are you? Great. Fat. How are you? I'm fine. It's a nice looking baby you got there. The one down here, I mean. Well, you look like you're doing okay. I am. I'm doing pretty good myself. I'm in town on business for a few days. I gotta go. Doctor's appointment. You take care. Nice to see you. I guess she managed to get over me. I guess she did. There's her guy. If you're waiting for Pete Dixon, he's not coming, Mr. Moore. What are you talking about? You paid his brother a lot of money to steal Laura Robertson's medical file. I did no such thing. Why were you going to expose Laura's medical history? You can answer in court if necessary. Well, Laura just waltzed into a job that I worked a lifetime to get. I was determined to stop this appointment. That's why I hired Luke, but he crossed me up. So you killed him? No, no. I never stepped foot in that motel room. Where were you the night of the murder? At a testimonial dinner. Mr. Moore, it would have been very easy to slip out during the after-dinner speech and slip back in again unnoticed. Yes. But how easy is it when you're sitting on a dais, Mr. Basin, giving the after-dinner speech with a hundred witnesses? Here's a list of your phone messages and your notes from today. And you still haven't looked at the photos from the fundraiser. Thank you, Della. How's your leg? Medium rare. It hurts. Take your medicine. If you need anything, I'll be in my room. Della. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now. Night. Oh, 
dear God. All rise. Courtroom 92 of the Denver District Superior Court is now open and ready for the transaction of business. The Honorable Eleanor Daniels presiding. Be seated. Defense may proceed. Your Honor, defense calls Audrey Pratt to the stand. And you've been Mrs. Robertson's executive assistant for how long, Mrs. Pratt? Almost a year. But you worked with her prior to that? Yes, for nine years. Were you working for her September 12th, the day of the big fundraiser? Of course. Did she get many phone calls that day? Well, yes. People were calling left and right to congratulate her on her a possible appointment to the Senate. Did you keep a record of those calls? I always write down the name of the caller, the time of the call, and whether or not Mrs. Robertson takes the call. I'd like you to think back, if you would, Mrs. Pratt. Do any of the calls that came in that day stand out in your mind? Well, I do remember receiving a call that day that was a bit unusual. In what way? The caller refused to give me his name. I remember arguing with him. He, he said he just had to speak with Mrs. Robertson, but he wouldn't tell me who he was. What finally happened? I put him through. Mrs. Robertson spoke with him briefly, as I recall, no more than two minutes. Were you present at the fundraiser that was held that night? You know I was, Mr. Mason. Well, that's right. We spoke about it several days ago, didn't we? I think you said Laura Robertson was never out of your sight except for the time she spent with me. That's right. Mrs. Pratt, I've known you for a long time. You've always been an honest and forthright person. Thank you. I'm sure that you wouldn't knowingly commit perjury while under oath, would you? Of course not. Did Mrs. Robertson leave the hotel at any time that evening? I don't know. Perhaps. What time did she leave? She left at 9.45. She told me that she was going to have a private meeting with some backers and that I should cover for her. But she didn't come back, did she? At least not right away. No. Do you remember what time she returned? Around 10.30. Thank you, Mrs. Pratt. That'll be all. I call Laura Robertson. Mrs. Robertson, as you know, you cannot be forced to testify against your husband. Yes, I know. I show you this photograph, Mrs. Robertson, and ask if you can identify it and tell us when and where it was taken. Uh, that's my associate, Jennifer Parker, and me. It was taken at the fundraiser on the evening of September 12th. Was the photograph taken before you left the party? I don't know. This is a blow-up of part of that photograph. Could you tell the court what you see? Jennifer's wearing a watch. It says 9.20. Uh, that was before I left the party. The man who called you at the office that afternoon but refused to leave his name, who was he? Just a well-wisher, I suppose. I don't remember. Was it the blackmailer, Luke Dixon? No. Wasn't he calling to make sure your husband would deliver the money? Now, think carefully before you answer. The answer is no. You're certain? A 
Objection asked and answered. Please, Laura, don't make this more difficult. Uh, would counsel kindly speak up so that the court can hear his examination? Isn't it true that you left the fundraiser to go to the Pioneer Motel where you had a violent argument with Luke Dixon and accidentally, accidentally killed him? Objection, Your Honor. Counsel is using this witness not to elicit testimony, but to engage in pure speculation. It isn't speculation, Your Honor. I can prove that Laura Robertson was at that motel. Then by all means, proceed. You smoke, Mrs. Robertson? Occasionally. Sergeant Austin testified this cigarette case was found here on the floor, below the window. But Mr. Robertson says when he tripped, things fell out of his pocket, over here, near the foot of the bed, across the room. You see, Glenn Robertson just assumed that this cigarette case was in his pocket when he tripped and fell that night. But it wasn't, was it? You had it. No, I... Look at this photograph. The photograph you identified as having been taken at the fundraiser. There you are with Jennifer Parker. Her watch says 920. What is that in your right hand, Mrs. Robertson? What is that? People's Exhibit 9, isn't it? It's this cigarette case, isn't it? Your husband didn't have the cigarette case that night, you did. And you dropped it in Luke Dixon's motel room. That is the truth, is it not? When Luke Dixon called my office, I found out that Glenn was going to pay him the blackmail. I decided to go to the motel before he arrived and try to get the file from Dixon. Your husband did not know that you were going? No. What happened when you arrived in Luke Dixon's room? He was surprised to see me. I tried to convince him to give me the file but when he thought he wouldn't get paid, he became ugly. I tried to take the file from him. He struck me. I fought back. He fell and hit his head. I panicked and ran. And you never told that to your husband? No. I allowed my husband, who has never given me anything but love and support, to stand trial. I used the loyalty and trust of my friends to protect myself. I succumbed to a consuming ambition and let it destroy everything that I felt. I'm sorry. Your Honor, 
In view of these developments, I move that the people's case against Glenn Robertson be dismissed. Mr. Reston? State concurs. Case dismissed. All rise. Dixon's death was clearly accidental. Any lawyer can prove that. But if you and Laura need me, I'll be back. I was sure with you representing Glenn, he wouldn't be convicted. I was right. I didn't want things to turn out this way. That she knows. Aria. I know the creme de creme, and they all agree. You can trust me. She's the one you want to talk of the evening. Whose name can open anyone's door? Aria. Who else can offer this and much more?
and I mean big trouble. I kept, I kept waiting for a, a, a priest to make an entrance in the second act and administer the last rites. Oh, come on, Tony. The audience loved us. Five curtain calls, for God's sake. This bunch of hicks would give five calls to a lecture on paint them. But you know what the New York critics are going to say? We are a sentimental cartoon. We would have been out of date in the 30s. Well, I don't know about the rest of you. I don't need that on my resume. Mel. The first act closer still doesn't work. The song is old fashioned. The, the lyrics are maudlin. The whole concept is it's prehistoric. I've told you a hundred times we need something tougher. All I hear is, yeah, Tony, sure. Well, I want to hear a new song! I want to hear it by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Well, of course I'm not. Somebody. Anybody. Okay, Mel? Yeah, Tony, sure. It shouldn't be too hard. Old score sounds like it came straight from your trunk. Would somebody mind telling me why six? Count them. One, two, three, four, five, four. Six of our hookers made their entrance late in the police raid. Kate, you're choreographing our little funeral here. Now, is it too much to ask your hookers to make their entrance on cue and not whenever they damn well please? Tony, they have a really big change there, and it's not their fault. The intercom, damn... Tony. I beg your pardon? The intercom system wasn't working by the time I got backstage to the dressing room. And, and whose responsibility was it to see that the intercom system was working? Well, you know, I had a lot of new light cues. I just asked you a question, Johnny. Okay. It was my responsibility. Oh, like it was your responsibility to make sure that there, there was a pianist at the understudy rehearsal last week? Yes. You are a flake. That's not fair, Tony. If you don't get your shabby little act together, I'm going to make sure you end up swabbing out toilets in some crummy little dinner theater. You've got no right to talk to me that way. Why not? You don't have the guts to do anything about it. Oh, yeah? Hey, what are you doing? Hey, Johnny, for God's sake! Stop it, will you? Hey, come on. Oh, for God's sake! You are fired, Whitman! Tony! You will never work another Broadway show again! You hear me? Never! Hey, come on, Tony, come on. Johnny's a hell of a good stage manager, you know that. You just got him a little crazy, that's all. So just cool off, and then we'll sit down and talk this over, all right? I'm running this show. You get a problem with that, you get yourself another director. I'm sorry, Johnny. I really am. Somebody ought to drive a stake through your heart. You? Yeah, maybe. James, our crucial scene just kind of lies in the middle of the road like a dead dog. I mean, it's not funny. It's not moving. It's not anything. I think your TV roots are showing. And they're not very pretty. I want it rewritten first thing in the morning. We'll get it rehearsed and into the show by tomorrow night. And while you're at it, look at that first scene between Tom and Amanda because Polly Adler, she was a real woman, not some cheap. May West impressionist. I thought the scene played pretty well. Well, as usual, you're wrong. Damn it, Tony, you are the most insensitive, insulting, arrogant. Oh, oh, listen up here, kiddies. Our fading star, the silver screen, she actually can display an honest emotion. You're a pig, Tony. I'd like to reciprocate. I just don't want to waste my time. All right, that's it. <clears throat> but from now on, get ready. Plenty of more changes, because you're going to get them. And Mel, James... I mean it. By tomorrow morning. Yeah? What do you want? It's after two o'clock in the morning, for God's sake. Come to there now. Are you out of your mind? Did you call the police? 
No, 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 no. You're right. You're right. If she's okay. It's better to be quiet. I'll be right over. I have to go on down to the theater. A man that tried to kill himself. On the stage. It's just the kind of thing that hammy old relic would do. I don't know how long I'm going to be down there, so you better get your tail out of here. It's been fun, my dear. We'll do it again sometime. My mama. It's after 2 a.m. Why aren't we asleep? Our knee has its own idea. Well, when did we take our last medication? 10 o'clock. Well, that's good. But... I think we should take another pill right now. And I want you to know that we can't be responsible for that watch if it gets stolen. This watch was a Christmas present, and I want you to know that we are completely responsible for it. I'd rather not. I know, but even arthroscopic surgery takes its toll on the system. This is our second night here. And if we want the doctor to discharge us in the morning, then it would be much better if he found us bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I have never had the slightest desire to be bushy-tailed. But we do want to get out of here, don't we? You bet. Now, we should get in bed. You first. You! In bed. Can we manage that by ourselves? Sorry, fella. Wish I could help. Is it? Well, we're really in a good mood today, aren't we? Della, do me a favor. Don't use the word we. Has the doctor been by yet to release you from the hospital? Nope. <laughs> well, he better get you out of here soon, or you're not going to be fit to reenter. Johnny Whitcomb, stage manager of the musical Holly, is being taken into custody for the murder of the musical's director, Tony Franken. Now, Whitcomb publicly threatened Franklin's life just hours before the murder, which took place at the Paramount Theater at 2.30 a.m. Witnesses in the neighboring building say they heard the shots at that time, but failed to report them. We'll have details in there. What's the matter, Perry? You know this, Franken? No, but I know that boy didn't kill him. How? I saw him. What's his name? Whitcomb. Right under that street lamp at the time of the murder. Are you sure? I remember looking at my watch as he was standing there, and the theater where this Franken was murdered is at least three or four miles from here. What are you going to do? I don't know. He'll likely be arraigned this morning. Well, as soon as the doctor releases you, you can just go down and clear the boy. I'm afraid it's not that simple. Just tell him what you told me. Any halfway decent prosecutor would tear me apart. I don't. Adela, get my clothes for me, will you please? I'm going downtown with you. Good. Then you can watch me make a world-class fool of myself. Let's see, Mr. Macy. 
You believe you saw the defendant on that park bench at about 2.27 a.m., is that right? Yes, I looked at my watch. But you were in a hospital about how many yards away? About 30. And although it was overcast that night, you believe you could make out his features by the streetlight? Yes, I believe so. How was the man you saw dressed? He was wearing the same clothes he has on now, plus an overcoat and a hat. Weren't you in the hospital for some sort of knee surgery? Yes, an arthroscopy. Mr. Mason, were you given some sort of sedation or painkiller before you went to sleep that night? Yes. And that would have been 40 milligrams of oxalidine, wouldn't it? Actually, I'd taken 20 milligrams at 10 p.m. simple yes or no will do. Did you ingest 40 milligrams of oxalidine? Yes. Mr. Mason, is it your testimony that on a moonless night from a hospital room 30 yards away, after ingesting enough medication to put most of us in a coma, you're able to identify this defendant, a stranger whose face you've never seen before, as the man you saw in the park in the middle of the night? Yes, I believe it to have been him. No further questions. The defense rests, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. On the basis of the evidence presented here, this defendant shall be bound over to Superior Court for trial on March 15th at 8.30 a.m. Bail shall continue in the amount of $250,000. So after I left the theater, I bought myself a bottle of whiskey and just wandered the streets for a couple of hours, maybe. I guess I was just trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. Do you remember where you went? No, not really. I've never been in this town before. I do remember going to the park. I broke my bottle. I'm glad I went there or you wouldn't have seen me. I'm afraid that doesn't help us. Anyway, after, after that, I went back to the hotel maybe about three. Bought myself another bottle and drank myself into oblivion. I don't remember anything after that until the police pounded on my door at about 7.30 this morning. And found the gun in your room. Mr. Mason, I swear I never saw that gun before. terrible tragedy, and I know how shocked all of you must be. Nevertheless, I intend for us to open in New York on the 3rd of next month. This morning, I phoned Gavin Austin. He's flying in from New York today to take over as director. Most of you know Gavin, and I'm sure you share my faith in him. We'll see the show tonight, and I've called a rehearsal for him at 10 o'clock tomorrow. We've got a great show here, kids. And although we'll all miss Tony, the show as he would have wanted, will definitely go on. Right now, Mel and James will fill you in on the new material, all right? Mr. Mason, I'm Amanda Cody. I know. I've admired you for years. Uh, and so have I. <laughs> this is my associate, Della Street. Off the street? Hello. Please, it's Della and Perry. Uh, Perry... Is there any way I can convince you to represent Johnny? I've, I've called my attorney on the coast, but he isn't a criminal lawyer. After all, you're right here in town already, and I just... You see, Johnny's a very decent young man. He couldn't have done such a thing. I don't think so either. And I am representing him. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I mean, Johnny will be so pleased. Mr. Mason... My name is Blaine Counter. I'm the producer of Polly. Is there anything I can do for you? I'm Johnny Whitcomb's attorney. My associate, Della Street. How do you do? Really? Uh, you know, I'm arranging Johnny's bail. Oh. I'll see you both later. We'll look forward to it. 
Uh, excuse me, but I'm going to go make those calls. Oh, try and locate Ken Melansky. I need to talk to him. Mr. Counter, do you have any idea what Franken was doing here at the theater at 2.30 in the morning? No, I don't. But I just fired the security guard who was supposed to be here all night. Uh, Parker somebody. A moron left the place at midnight to go see his girlfriend. Where did he come from? Some local employment agency. I don't even know his last name. I'd like the agency address. Oh, of course. I overheard you saying that the production will continue. Yes, it will. But uh, not because of the old showbiz tradition. I happen to have a lot of my own money invested in it. I had extraordinary faith in Polly. I still have. Without Tony Franken? Well, we've still got Amanda Cody. She'll sell a lot of tickets. Oh, I'm sure of that. She's wonderful. Even last night. Last night? What about last night? Well, I was given to understand that she had a very upsetting call from the coast. But on stage, she was superb. Watching your company just now, I didn't see much evidence that Tony Franken would be missed. Tony Franken was a brilliant theater man, Mr. Mason, but a despicable human being. You still hired him. Well, quite simply, he was the best director I could find. I had to protect my investment as well as my other investors. And, of course, Amanda. Mr. Counter, where were you at the time of the murder? I, I was alone in my hotel room. Why? Pardon me. Uh, here's the list, Perry. I tried to reach Ken, but I could only reach his answering machine. Mr. Counter, I wonder if I might speak to your company for a moment. Of course. All right, hold it a minute. Now listen, kids, this is Mr. Perry Mason. He's Johnny's lawyer, and he'd like to uh, talk to you. Thank you. First, I'd like to tell you all that I have good reason to believe that Johnny Whitcomb did not murder Tony Franken last night. But proving that may be somewhat difficult. Now, I understand... There was an after-theater party given for you last night by the City Theater Society, which some of you apparently did not attend. Mr. Mel Singer and wife Leslie, Mr. James Walton, Mr. Blaine Counter, and Amanda Cody. Everyone else seems to have been at the party until it ended, nearly 3 a.m., is that correct? Well, what does that mean? Well, if everyone who went to the party can prove they were there the whole time... That gives them a pretty good alibi. Those not at the party are suspect in Tony Franken's murder. Suspect until we find out which one of you killed him. Well, Mr. Mason, Ed Brock, homicide? It's Lieutenant now, isn't it? Good to see you again, Ed. I appreciate your meeting me here. You too, officer. Just call me Ray. All right, Ray. This was Tony Franken's room. We cleared out all the evidence. Any pictures? Ray, pictures... To this picture, Mr. Franken must have had a visitor the night of the murder. Mm -hmm. Any prints? Layton's. We couldn't get a match, so we sent him back to Washington. I'd like to know what took Franken to the theater at 2.30 in the morning. Well, I figured Whitcomb must have called him with some cock and bull story. Mind showing me where you found the gun? Room 511, Ray. That was Whitcomb's room. The gun was right here behind these soft drink bottles. And who found the body? The cleaning crew from the theater. At about seven in the morning. Who told you about the threat Whitcomb made to Frank? The producer of the show, Mr. Counter. He called him and asked him to come down to identify the body. And he told us the whole story. Luring Franken to the theater sounds pretty complicated. 
since that was Franken's room right there. And this is Johnny's room right here. But a shot would have wakened the whole hotel. And since Franklin was right next door, Johnny probably could have heard that he had a visitor. That visitor could be very important, wouldn't you say, Lieutenant? Miss Massey, a Miss Treat called for you. She left this message where you could find a guy called Molesky or something. Molesky. Thank you, Ray. You'll let me know about the prints on that glass. Will do, Mr. Mason. Thank you for your help. Now, Mrs. Pitts, you heard Mrs. Gilman testify that at approximately 9.30 p.m. on the night of March 3rd, your son, Walter, held her up at gunpoint and stole $173 from her, as well as forcing her to remove and hand over her underpants. Now, I ask you, Mrs. Pitts, where was your son, Walter, actually on the night of March 3rd this year? We was at my house, looking at TV the whole night. The whole night? Could you be a little more specific? Well, Walter come over just as Vanna was given a car away on Wheel of Fortune, and he didn't leave till right after Johnny Carson's monologue. You see, Johnny had Alan Thick guesting, and Walter don't like him a lot. Thank you, Mrs. Pitts. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. You can step down. You are excused. I call Father Alan Rooney. Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. State your name for the record, please. I'm Father Alan Rooney. Father Rooney, where were you on the night of March 3rd? I was at St. Sebastian's Church, as I am every Thursday night, calling the numbers. Could you explain that, Father? We have bingo every Thursday night, uh, for the benefit of the homeless, don't you? And did you see Mrs. Pitts there that night? I certainly did, son. In fact, she won $25 at the very last game, just before 10 o'clock it was. No further questions. I'm sorry, Vera. It's not your fault, Father. God forgive me. He's just no good. You're a pervert, Walter, and you always have been. You steal ladies oh, under there, and you make me lie under God's Mrs. own. Pitts. I hope they put Mrs. you away Pitts. for a hundred Pitts. years. Objection. Any cross-examination, Mr. Molensky? Uh, no, Your Honor. I'm ordering a ten-minute recess at this time. Mr. Molansky, in light of the testimony, I suggest you confer with your client and decide how you wish to proceed. I sincerely hope that you personally will have learned something from this uh, shabby chapter in the history of American jurisprudence. I'm real sorry, Mr. Molansky. Look, if you give me some time, I'll give you back the 500. I swear. 500? What 500? The 500 she gave me to give to you. Amy? Look, you weren't getting any clients, so I went down to the police station, you know, and I saw poor Walter here getting arraigned, and he looked so innocent. And he couldn't afford a lawyer, so... Yeah, and I already spent the money I stole from that dame. Great. Can I talk to you outside? Just perfect. You bought me a client? How do I know who's going to turn on this I just don't want you buying me clients. I don't care how much money you got. If I can't make it on my own, then I can't. And that's just a I was just trying to help. That's How many other clients you paid for? I've only had five since you opened the office two months ago. Six. Six clients. And how many of those did you put on your credit card? <laughs> don't be so... Oh, look who's here. Amy, Ken, how's it going? Uh, just wrapping up some trial work. Ken was terrific. I'm sure he was. How's your practice coming along? Some days are better than others. <laughs> I lost my first seven cases in municipal court 
Two of them were real embarrassments. You were there. You peeked in for a minute. Have you uh, heard about the Tony Franken murder? Hard to avoid. It's been all over the papers and TV. I'm representing the young man they arrested. Did he do it? Amy. It's a fair question. No, he didn't do it. Meanwhile, I could use some help if you have the time. I'm flattered. We'll fit it in. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Mason, if Ken's going to work on this case, then couldn't you make him co-counsel? Not on this one. Don't mind her, Mr. Mason. She means well, but sometimes she's a little pushy. What do you need? I need some investigative work. I'm never pushy. Great. Just tell me what to do. Well, they hired a local as night watchman at the theater who left his job the night of the murder to see some girl. Uh, find out about him. His not being there that night sounds just a little too convenient. Great. We'll get started right away. She can be your Della Street. Not a lot. Pretty much in the pop guy. Anything more on Tony Franken? until the show Tony hadn't worked for over three years. Evidently, the producers didn't want the aggravation. I encountered it. I wonder why. Well, we'll run a check on the ex-wives. That's all. Who knows? Ten minutes and uh, Gavin would like to put it on its feet. Right. Uh, as you heard, I have about ten minutes. Will that do? So far. We can talk in my dressing room. Yeah, will you take care of this? Have at the door for you. Thank you, Uncle Bill. Well, how's it going? Pretty well, I think. Mel's new song is marvelous, and Gavin has some really smashing ideas. There was this tedious ballet in the second act, and he just took it out, and now... The whole show plays better. It's incredible. You don't miss Tony Frank. Like I'd miss a migraine headache. Oh, I'm sorry. I know that sounds awfully cruel. Tony was a truly loathsome man. You really meant what you said about us being suspect? I'm afraid I did. You know, maybe none of this would have happened. Blaine had stepped in like he should have. You mean when Tony fired John? Blaine's let Tony walk all over him about everything. That's very strange. I once read where he fired a choreographer for slapping a chorus girl. Well, he's obviously changed. I did understand that he'd proposed marriage to you. Well, I didn't think that my private life was so public. Yes, he did. You see, his wife died a few years ago, and he said he... he thought he'd never remarry until he met me. That's very flattering, of course. But naturally, I turned him down. I mean, you can't marry a man without a backbone. I'm sorry to have to ask this, but where were you when Tony was murdered? You really do think that I might have killed him? 
But why would I? Maybe because you knew Tony Franklin was planning to replace you in the show. We heard you'd received a disturbing call from the coast, so on a hunch, Della contacted your manager. He was unhappy about being fired and very, very talkative. My ex-manager has a very big mouth, and he probably told you that Tony and I didn't get along too well. But then nobody got along with Tony. But I didn't kill him, Perry. And I know Johnny didn't either. You seem very sure of that. Some things you just know when you get. It seems to me that being replaced would have been very painful for you, wouldn't it? An earthquake, my friend. You said you were a fan of mine, but I'm sure you haven't seen me at your neighborhood movie theater lately. You see, this business can be pretty rough on old broads like me. <laughs> I'd say that time has been very good. Thanks. Well, if you'll excuse me, they want me back on the stage. We must get together sometime and have fun. I told you, it's the policy of this agency to respect the privacy of its clients. I don't want his tax return. Just his name. Parker what? I'm very busy and I don't have time to argue with you. All right. This is confidential, but I'll tell you the real reason why I need to talk to you. While he was working at the theater, several of the actors reported having valuables stolen from their dressing rooms. Now, I'd like to ask this Parker some questions, and I'm sure you'd like the police to know that you cooperated fully with our investigation. Yes, of course I would. Good. But you are not the police, and I would appreciate your before I call them and charge you with harassment. Really? Come on. Great. Mr. Mason asked for one simple thing and I strike out. His name's Parker Newton, and he was kicked off the police force for brutality. He lives at 552 Morgan Street, apartment 4B. What? By the way, that woman is really very sweet. Here's his personnel application. Nice work. Now, where will I drop you? I'm going with you. You just said this Newton was kicked off the force for brutality. All the more reason you should be told. I think the show has finally taken shape. Morale is way up. The new director put back the ballad Tony cut. It's Amanda's one real moment of vulnerability, and the show really needed it. I'll get right to the point, Mr. Walton. I'm told you came by Tony's room just as they were arresting Johnny Whitcomb. Yeah. I was delivering my script changes. I was up all night with him. What do I find? Tony's murdered? Johnny busted for it? <sighs> Talk about shock. I'm also told Tony was pretty hard on you. You or your work. Mr. Mason, I come out of TV, where everybody and his astrologer tells you how to do it better. You don't like it, but you get used to it. He intended putting his name on the show as co-author, didn't that bother you? Yeah, well, um, he never got the chance, did he? You couldn't be more right. Whoa, hey, 
I don't like where you're going. I'll tell you, Mr. Mason, if Tony had really tried something like that, he would have been up to his neck in my lawyers. Wouldn't it still have cast doubt on your ability to write for Broadway? Excuse me. Lieutenant Brock just spoke for you. Um, later, Mr. Mason. Later, Mr. Walton. What did Brock want? They've taken Leslie Singer in for questioning. The composer's wife? Mm -hmm. Washington finally matched the prints on Tony's glass. They belong to her. I won't let you do it. That's why we're here. It says he's 6'2", weighs 210. An ex-cop who brutalizes people. I'll just ask him a few questions. You know, what if you ask him the wrong one? Look, I'm not impugning your masculinity. I knew I shouldn't have let you come. Darling, I only want to help. I mean, I know you and everybody else think I'm just some rich little kid who giggled her way through college, but I'd like to show you that maybe I can really do something. You know what I mean? Actually contribute. Look, why don't you sort of think of me as your Della Street? Security guard business pays better than I thought. Stay put. Dan! Remember brutality! Excuse me. Your name Parker Newton? What the hell is it to you? My name's Kim Alansky. I'm a lawyer. Congratulations, Mr. Kim Alansky, but that doesn't exactly answer my question, does it? No, Ken Molansky. I know you said that before. Yeah, well, you see, I work for another lawyer named Perry Mason. You might have heard of him. We represent the man who's accused of killing Tony Franken. So what's that got to do with me? Just want to know what you saw at the theater that night. Not a thing. Like I told the cops, I took over on midnight. See your girlfriend. Funny time for a date, isn't it? Look, Cassie works all day in this dress store. I was working all night at the theater, so we never get a chance to be together. Too bad you took off that particular night. Yeah. How was I supposed to know that someone to get murdered? Not a damn thing ever happened in the three weeks I was there. Where's your girlfriend work? Me and you just finished talking. I understand you used to be a cop. Look, punk, I told you. Get out of my face now. Move. Nice chatting with you. Serious creep. I'd sure like to talk to this girlfriend now. She works at some dress store. Molly's. What's this? The dress store? Very overpriced from what I hear, but I found it in the back of Newton's car, and I don't think they carry his size. Craig, <laughs> tell me where it is, and I'll drop you someplace. I told you I'm not droppable. Like it or not, we're in this together. Della Street, remember? Della Street? You can't even type. I've had her in there almost 45 minutes. Should be out soon, Mr. Singer. It's Mel. Thanks. I'll tell you. You wanted to know where I was. Tony was killed, right? That's right. I was working on the new song that Tony wanted. I couldn't have a piano in my room, so I was working in one of the lounges downstairs. Some of the staff must have seen me or, uh, <laughs> or heard me. Didn't you resent it? Tony kept you coming up with new songs? No. This is my seventh Broadway show. I probably written two, three songs for every one of you. That's why they call it a trial. You did your last... Your last show in 1969. Yeah. Yeah, they sort of put me on hold. That is, until they had a show that needed music instead of noise. 
Actually, my whole life was on hold. Until I met Leslie, of course. Uh, Mel. Do you know why Leslie was in Tony's room the night he was murdered? Look, Mr. Mason, I have no illusions about why Leslie married me. I'm this semi-famous old guy with ASCAP royalties that'll roll in forever. But I married her because I love her. More than I've ever loved anybody else in my whole life, including my first wife, God rest her soul. And yeah, I know she cheats on me. And yeah, I guessed about her and Tony. But I'll never confront her with that, ever. You see, I won't take the chance of losing her. Most men couldn't live that way. You think I was the one who killed Tony because I was jealous? <laughs> well, why would I? There's always going to be another Tony. good to be true. Well, anyway, she didn't solve much of the puzzle. But somebody did call Tony Franken saying that Amanda Cody had tried to kill herself down at the theater. Franken goes down there. Mrs. Singer doesn't know if it was a man or a woman. It doesn't do very much to get your final hook up, Mr. Mason. Apparently not. He, uh, must have got to my place at, uh, 12.15. And, like you said, you know... Spent the whole night together. And you're sure about the time? Oh, I don't know. You know, maybe it was 12.20. Oh. <laughs> uh, it, it was right around then. Excuse me. Okay. Thanks. Backed up his story. She seemed awfully like jittery, though. I think she's lying. Ken, look. Sign. We're out of your mind. Do you want to break this case or not? Of course I do, but I don't want you involved in something dangerous. Working in that store is not dangerous. Shocking is. Amy, you've never worked a day in your life. Amy! I pay the minimum wage plus a 5% commission. You have a half an hour for lunch. And don't use the phone unless we're on fire. No friends hanging around. And if you're late, it comes out of your pay. Any questions? No. Do you have any experience? Uh, well, uh, let me put it this way. Valentino from the last year's line, Dan Klein, Ongaro, he also makes this in green silk, Donna Karen, Adolfo, and another Valentino. This year's and it's great. Anyway, it's like we're old friends. I tell her about us, and she tells me about them. Tell everybody about us. I had to get her confidence, didn't I? And I did. She's told me a lot. Like what? Well, I sometimes she's frightened of Newton. Like, uh, he hates broccoli. Like, 
He works out at this gym called Harry's every day. Like he's not even looking for another job, even though he still talks about getting married. He's not looking for another job, but he is driving a new Corvette. I'd sure like to get a look at his bank book. I'll see you tonight, okay? And then I discovered the weapon which was hidden in the mini bar and the defendant's hotel room. Lieutenant, I'm now showing you People's Exhibit 9, a 38 caliber revolver, which Lieutenant Maxwell of your ballistics department has previously identified as the murder weapon. Is that the weapon you found in the defendant's room? Yes, it is. It has my mark. Were there any fingerprints found on this gun? No, because Whitcomb apparently wiped them off. Objection. Of Speculation, no foundation. Motion to strike. Sustained. The testimony after the witness's response of no is stricken from the record. When you first arrived at the defendant's room, Lieutenant Brock, was the door locked? Ah, uh, yes, it was. We need the manager's master key to get in. You see, it's the type of doors that lock automatically when they're closed. So, if some other person planted the gun in the defendant's room... They would have needed a key to get in. Thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions. Mr. Mason. No questions, Your Honor. <laughs> so, what do you do? Oh, I'm an attorney. Yeah? Yeah. That's well, I guess most lawyers could use the gym. <laughs> All that sitting around on the desk. Believe me, I know. I, I was wondering if you have anything like a trial membership. No. No. Try it out. Right now. No charge. Great. But I didn't bring my gear. But we'll fix you up. Hey, Willie. Hey, where do you see the machines we got? Other gems would kill for. <laughs> yeah, Willie, give Mr. Malinsky here some no, stuff. No, no, uh, Malansky. Malansky, some stuff he can use to work out. Sure, this way. Great, I'll see you later. Yeah. Sir, did the defendant say anything after you pulled him away from Mr. Franken? He said uh, somebody ought to drive a stake through your heart. And then what happened? Then Tony asked him if he, Johnny, was going to be the one to do it, and he said, yeah, maybe. No further questions. Your witness, Counselor. Mr. Counter, why didn't you object when Franken fired the defendant? I did. I told him that uh, Johnny was a damn fine stage manager. But you're the producer. Surely you could countermand such an arbitrary dismissal. Well, yes, I'm the producer, but uh, ordinarily the director has jurisdiction over the backstage personnel, and uh, I didn't feel that it was my place to interfere. Tony Franken was considering replacing Amanda Cody in your show, wasn't he? Well, I'd heard rumors to that effect. And would you have countermanded that dismissal? Objection. Hypothetical and irrelevant. Sustained. Mr. Counter... Could you describe for us the manner in which Tony Franken customarily dealt with creative talent? Tony was a bully. He was a marvelous director, but he was terribly cruel and uh, insulting to almost everybody he worked with. I have no further questions at this time, but I reserve the right to recall this witness. No questions, Your Honor. The witness is excused, subject to recall. Hey, Newt. And you really hung up on this place, aren't you? You think I want to turn into a tough about like you? Yeah. Let's find out who quits first. I really screwed up. I was working out. I must have lost my keys someplace. No problem. Which lock? Uh, this one. Right here. Thanks. I'll take care of you later.
to get me in? I want on new bikes with a computer. <laughs> the factory tell you how many days you got to live. <laughs> what are you selling, steroids? You can't afford that stuff, man. <laughs> Come on. You kidding? Membership's up 20% over last month. Maybe even hooked a lawyer today. In fact, I better make sure. Hey, Maliski! Hey, funny he wasn't... You got here, Harry. I think I'll pass on the membership. I'll get you, man. I'll get you. Mason. How'd it go today? Very well. The judge is going to allow us to put the victim on trial. The way I hear it, Tony Franken made enemies the way most people make friends. That's what I intend to show. I had a pretty good day myself. I got a look at Parker Newton's checkbook. You know, the security guard? Mm -hmm. There were two recent cash deposits of $25,000 each. The first deposit was made the day after Franken's death. The second deposit yesterday. Nice work. You sure getting paid for something. We find out who's paying. We got our killer. We better talk to Newton officially. Yeah. Get this to the clerk's office, and you take it from there. Newton. Newton. Swell. You see, this is the directory. I enter all my notes and all of the summaries according to the case name. At, at least those for the last couple of years. Of course, if you want all of the cases in here, it's going to take me till the middle of the next century. By that time, computers will be obsolete. They'll be implanting chips in all the odd parts of our brain and skull. I wish they could find some for my knee. So do I. What else? Now, let's see. Two of Tony's ex-wives are happily remarried and living in New York. The third is a costume designer in London. And uh, here's a photo staff of that young actress who committed suicide. Her name was Vanessa Grant. She left a note saying she was pregnant and couldn't go on living without Tony. Of course, he denied the whole thing. A real prison. Oh, and look at this. Uh, Blaine Counter. His wife died four years ago. And they had a coroner's investigation. Cancer... Overdose of sleeping pills, self-administered. So, no charges were brought. No. Oh. Something else. James Walton's hotel bill as of yesterday. Some interesting charges, right? Very. Now... Why don't you tell your machine everything you just told me, and I'll be back soon. Oh, Della. If the machine comes up with the name of the killer, don't forget to make a note of it. I do for you? You have a few minutes? Oh, sure. Come on in. Uh, coffee? Uh, no, thank you. I don't want to interrupt your work. Oh, I'm uh, just getting started. 
It's a TV pilot I've got due next week. You're not working on Polly? Oh, no. <laughs> Ever since that last set of rewrites I did, that show has been frozen. Thank God. I'd like to show you something, Mr. Walton. It's a copy of my hotel bill. I just wondered why you've sent Kate Ferrara a dozen roses every night since rehearsals began. So, that's why you dropped by? Well, uh... The roses are part of a promise I made Kate. You see, at first we only wanted her for lead dancer, and she didn't want to do it. I promised if she would, I would send her a dozen roses every night. Well, she finally took the job when Tony let her choreograph, but meanwhile I was stuck with my promise. Doesn't uh, this indicate more than a professional interest? <sighs> you got me. <laughs> it was more. Does anybody still use the word smitten? She was involved with Tony, wasn't she? What are you getting at? You think uh, I killed Tony because I was jealous? <laughs> Mr. Walton, people have killed... Or a lot less. Mr. Mason, you're barking up the wrong tree. Tony was finished with Kate. At the time he was killed, he was sleeping with Leslie Singer. So if anyone was going to be jealous, it was Mel Singer. <laughs> Not me. Apparently, Mr. Singer has his problems. But then I believe so do you. I still consider both of you suspects. Thank you for your time, Mr. Walton. What the hell? This is a subpoena requiring you to testify at Johnny Wickham's trial tomorrow. See you there. Tony was very abusive. And Johnny just lost control. But it was... Obvious that he didn't mean he was actually going to kill Tony. It's just one of those things you say in the heat of anger. Tony always provoked a lot of anger from everybody. I think he enjoyed doing it. From your knowledge of Johnny Whitcomb's character, do you think there's any possibility he could have, with premeditation, murdered Tony Franklin? Johnny would be incapable of murdering anybody. Thank you, Miss Cody. I have no questions. Miss Cody, you may step down. Wait. Listen, I, I know Johnny couldn't have killed Tony because I was with Johnny all night. Why didn't you tell us that before? Because I had lied to the police and I... I told them that I'd been in my room sleeping. You see, I never thought it would go this far. And why were you in the defendant's room, Miss Cody? I was upset about him being fired and... I couldn't sleep anyway, so I... I went to his room about... 2.15 and... He was passed out on his bed, so... I stayed with him until almost dawn. So you see, he couldn't have been at the theater and killed Tony. How did you get into the defendant's room? Oh, he'd uh, given me a key. How do you explain the defendant's own statement to the police that he did not get back to the hotel until nearly 3 a.m.? All right. I'll tell you the truth. The reason that I know... Johnny didn't kill Tony Franken is because I killed him myself. Miss Cody, is it true that Johnny Whitcomb is your son? Yes. Yes, we kept it a secret. I suppose... I didn't want my public to know I was old enough to have a grown son. It was stupid of me. But it does help us understand some of your behavior. 
I have no further questions. Miss Cody, you did not kill Mr. Franken, did you? No. But I can't just sit here. He didn't do it. But all these people out there think that he did. I... Miss Cody, we understand that you love your son. But this is not the way to help him. I'm going to ask you to step down now. I don't know whether the district attorney will be charging you with perjury or not. Your Honor, the district attorney's office has no interest in filing charges against this witness. Can you believe it? She wants $1,400 for this. <laughs> I mean, my boyfriend has to work a whole month for that. What about yours? Can you afford to spring out on her like this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Sure. What's the matter? I'm leaving town tonight. What'd you do now? Nothing. It's just getting a little too hot here, that's all. You're in trouble again, aren't you? Listen, no arguments. Just go home and pack, and I'll pick you up at your place at six. Baby, it's almost five o'clock. Just do it, okay? emergency i gotta leave early okay you can't go it's still over half an hour before closing i know what I, I can't help it okay i'm sorry i i'll see you later <laughs> not here you won't you're fired what are you doing uh a wild guess using the phone no smart mouth remarks thank you and i told you no personal calls Telling you something. You have a terrible attitude problem. And your markups are obscene. <laughs> Six. Oh, my God, that's 45 minutes. Listen, she lives at the Astor apartment on 21st. No matter what happens, I love you. Bye. Counter, you've worked with Tony Franken before, haven't you? Yes, four years ago. And at that time, your wife was quite ill, wasn't she? Yes, she had cancer. And when she learned her cancer was inoperable, you wanted to help her, didn't you? What the hell has this got to do with Tony Franken's murder? Mr. Counter, I'm sorry that I must ask you about this very painful time in your life. But I believe it is relevant to my client's case. <laughs> your Honor, he has no right. Please answer the question. When my wife learned the cancer was inoperable... She made me promise I'd help her. It was her idea. Help her how, Mr. Counter? Help her to end her suffering when it became too much for her. And eventually, it did become too much for her, didn't it? Yes. So you asked Tony Franken to get you some sleeping pills. I didn't know how else to get them without a prescription, and I knew that Tony was into the drug scene... And then, look, what I'm going to say might get me in some trouble, but I guess it's about time I got it off my chest. I got the pills from Tony, and I gave them to my wife, and she decided to take them. And to this day, I can't say I'm sorry about it. I mean, she was in such terrible pain. <sighs> anyway, afterwards, everybody thought it was suicide, that she, she did it alone. Everyone except Tony. Is that why you hired him to again direct for you when nobody else would hire him? When he heard I was doing Polly, he hinted that if I didn't hire him, he'd make the whole thing public. 
And he continued to use that threat against you. At every opportunity. That's why I had to just stand by and let him fire Johnny. And you had no way of knowing, did you, how long he might continue to exercise this power over you? No. And you knew he was planning to fire Amanda Cody, a woman you'd asked to marry you. Yes. Wouldn't you say, Mr. Counter, you had a very strong motive to kill Tony? Say this, I've never been happier to see a man dead. At the time of the murder, you were working in your hotel room alone, were you not? Yes. But it would have been very simple, wouldn't it, for you to leave the hotel and return without being seen? Probably, but I never left my room. But you have no witness to confirm that. Mr. Mason, when I first met you, you told us you considered some of us suspects. So I thought I'd better protect myself. You see, one of my investors called me that night from Honolulu to find out how the show was doing. Last week, I asked him to send me a copy of his phone bill. He sent me this. Now, it shows... A long-distance call from Mr. McQueen directly to my room phone on the night of the murder. And you'll also see that, allowing for the time difference, we spoke from 2.15 a.m. to 2.39 a.m. Mr. McQueen will confirm that he was talking to me during that time period. No further questions? Miss August? No questions. Thank you, Mr. Conner. Maybe excuse Goodbye. Ma'am, can you please move your car? Can I have an address? Maybe I'll come visit. We don't have an address. Now move your car. In a minute. No! All right, you don't have to yell. boyfriend that night. I think it's time you told the truth. He told me to say that we were together that night. Did he kill Tony Frank? No. But he knew who did. How do you know that? He, um, sort of surprised the killer at the theater, I guess, and um, the man promised the money to keep quiet. He got the money, $50,000, and he was even trying to get some more. Who's the man he saw, Cassie? I don't know. He wouldn't tell me. 
And you're sure it was a man? I don't even know that. We should have heard from the hospital. Well, I'm sure Ken will call as soon as Parker Newton's able to talk. Anyway, shouldn't you be leaving for court? I still have half an hour. <laughs> Harry, you've been going over those papers forever. Don't know I have less to go on in this case than I've ever had. At this time, I know for a fact, a fact, my client is innocent. With all that, I'm still absolutely helpless. If I just hadn't taken those sedatives. Sorry, Mr. Mason. Newton died about 20 minutes ago. Didn't he ever regain consciousness? No. Rock had someone by his bed all night long. His oh girlfriend took it pretty hard, but I think she's going to be okay. That's it. What? You know who did it? Ken, I want you to do something for me, and fast. And I need you back in the courtroom in 40 minutes. Who are you calling? Rock. I want him to contact the hotel security chief. Lieutenant Brock, please. Brock. Mr. Mason, we're waiting on you. I finally reached Hector's equity. You guess that's right on target. Mr. Mason, is there a problem? Defense calls James Walton. Any word from Ken? Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth? I do. Mr. Walton, you are the book writer of the musical Polly? That's right. How did you get along with Tony Franken? Like most people, I suppose. He wasn't an easy man to like. Mr. Counter testified that he was often very harsh in his criticisms of your work. Yes, he certainly was. That annoyed you, did it not? Of course. But uh, it was just a part of his usual drill. Was his plan to claim co-authorship of the show also part of his drill? Objection. No relevancy. I tend to agree. Objection sustained. Please try to find a more relevant line of questioning, Mr. Mason. Certainly. Mr. Walton, what is the number of your hotel room? I'm in room 611. I would remind the court that Lieutenant Brock has already testified that the defendant's room is 511. Now, Mr. Walton, is there a fire escape outside the window of your hotel? Uh, I'm uh, not sure. Uh, maybe. Let me assure you there is. Just as there is one outside my client's room, just as there is one outside every room ending in the number 11. Objection. Relevancy. Your Honor, I am trying to establish that Mr. Walton's room was directly above that of the defendants, and that therefore Mr. Walton, through their mutual fire escape, had access to the defendant's room. An interesting point, Counselor. But what's your point here? To establish that Mr. Walton could have climbed down that fire escape and while the defendant was passed out, planted the murder weapon in the defendant's room and that he, of course, could have returned the same way. Objection overruled. Mr. Walton, did you murder Tony Franken? Did you place the murder weapon in the defendant's room after that murder? I never even saw the murder weapon until this trial. No. I didn't murder Tony Franken. I was in my room the entire night doing the script changes Tony asked for. Mr. Walton, I'm given to understand that television writers are noted for their speed. Isn't it possible you finished those changes earlier than you say, early enough to have lured Tony Franken to the theater and then to have killed him? Objection. The witness has already denied he murdered Tony Franken. Sustained. Mr. Mason, I must say I've been very patient with your questioning of this witness. 
I appreciate that, Your Honor. But I must ask you to make your examination more on point or finish with him. I'd uh, like to request a moment for a conference with my co-counsel. Granted. But let me remind you, Mr. Mason, the word moment is capable of strict definition. Co-counsel. Of course, co-counsel. Sorry about the time. That security guy wasn't too cooperative. It's all right. We're still in business. Uh, we're ready, Your Honor. Please proceed. Walton, do you do your writing on a word processor? No, I do. You saw me working on it. Does the program you use put a time and date on each file? I, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, maybe it does. I never really noticed. Maybe you should have. Would you identify this for us? Yes, this is a printout of my directory. There are some 13 files listed on this directory. After each one, there is a date and a time indicating the last time the file was worked on. Isn't that correct? Um, that's how it works. And here, after the file name Polly, it shows the date. The same date Tony Franken was murdered. Now, what was the hour? <clears throat> 1 37 a.m. Well, you did finish your work early. Early enough to have gone to the theater and taken Tony Franken's life. Now, that is true, isn't it? Objection. Asked and answered. Sustained. Is this as far as you can go, Mr. Mason? No, Your Honor. I intend to go a lot farther. Mr. Walton did indeed murder Tony Franken. It's crazy. What the hell motive would I have? Yes, that was also a problem for me. That is, until I had that visit with you in your room yesterday. Look, this was my first Broadway show. Now, now why would I kill the director that was going to take it to Broadway and make it a hit and make me a fortune? A good point, Mr. Walton. No, you wouldn't kill such a man. But you would kill a man who was responsible for the death of your sister. Mr. Walton, can you identify the people in that picture? It's, uh, myself, my sister, and um, my parents. Thank you. Hold on to that. I am now showing you a copy of a New York Examiner article and a photograph of a young woman that accompanies it. Can you tell me what the headline says? Actress commits suicide. And that actress was Vanessa Grant, and Vanessa Grant was really Edith Walton, and Edith Walton was really your sister. Isn't that true? Yes, it's, it's true. I'm now showing you People's Exhibit 9. Identified as the murder weapon. You recognize it, don't you? No, no. Here, take it. Now, do you recognize it? No. Your Honor... I would like to excuse this witness, subject to recall. Call Mr. Parker Newton to the stand. I'll get him, Mr. Mason. He's waiting out in the hall. All right. I'll ask you again, Mr. Walton. Have you ever seen that gun before? The 
This is the gun. This is the gun my sister used to kill herself. And you thought there would be some ironic justice if you used that gun, that same gun, to kill Tony Franken, isn't that right? I'm not sorry I did it. I'm only sorry that Johnny had to suffer through all this. Your Honor, the defense moves to dismiss all charges against Mr. Whitcomb. The state has no objection. Motion is granted, and defendant shall be released forthwith. Bailiff, take this man into custody. This court is now in recess. film version of our play. And I'll accept. If they'll let Johnny direct. Why not? He's certainly ready. <laughs> Amanda. Uh, uh, mother. Mother. Perry. Thanks hardly says it. It'll do. Oh. And we'll see you at the party after the show tonight? Absolutely. Uh, Miss Cody. I'm told there's a great many press people out in the corridor. If you'd like to go through my private chambers, you can use another exit. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Johnny? Mother? I want to thank you for making me co-counsel. No. Thank you, co-counsel. We'll do it again. All out in the very near future. Does our very near future still include the ice skating you promised me? It does. <laughs> Hope it's not thin ice. 